Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, my colleague, personal friend for many years, Dr. Uh, Jim Wright. Dr. Jim Wright um, is currently a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine and professor of pediatrics um, and a senior scientist at the University of Calgary. Um, Dr. Wright has a very unique profile and uh, he will share that with you today. Um, he is very well known in the pathology community in Canada and in the US. Um, when, when his name comes up, people think of eyelid transplantation, diabetes uh, research, um, and that is a uh, well-earned reputation. In Ontario, um, when the name uh, Jim Wright comes up, people think something else. Uh, because in Ontario, we were trying to do our thing with merging labs and merging hospitals, and there was always this uh, great icon of stamina and focus. His name was Jim Wright. So he was an icon of, uh, uh, and a role model for us in leadership for uh, putting people together, making people uh, work together in a, in a merger like the one he's going to share with us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Wright received most of his education from Ohio State, where he received his uh, bachelor in zoology, and followed by masters in the history of medicine. And that's what makes his profile quite unique. Uh, you don't meet people with masters in, uh, <laughs> in the history of uh, medicine every day. Um, and, and that stayed with him through his career. He has this very unique, um, uh, like a true historian, very unique ability to tell a story and make you live the event as he is describing it. Uh, his lecture yesterday to our residents and trainees about history of laboratory medicine uh, was very well received and it was recorded, so everybody's welcome to uh, uh, take a glimpse of that. I was walking with Amy right now and he, she just told me that shouldn't have been a lecture, it should have been a course. We need a course <laughs> to study a history of laboratory medicine. Um, in Ohio State, he also received his medical degree and uh, his PhD moved on to uh, University of Washington in St. Louis where he did his residency in Barnes Hospital um, in pathology and was a postdoc in uh, eyelid transplantation laboratory. He then uh, moved to uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Canada uh, to, um, to, to finish his perinatal and pediatric pathology fellowship, stayed on faculty all the way to being the director of anatomical pathology at Dalhousie uh, University uh, in Nova Scotia. For some reason, he decided to uh, take the chairmanship uh, at the University of Calgary, and he made the uh, move across the great uh, country of Canada and became the chair for not one term, but for two terms. That was at 2005, right after the uh, merger of what became Calgary Laboratory uh, Services, or CLS, was formed. And uh, uh, this is where he, in these 10 years, he earned uh, his title of the greatest stamina in pathology in Canada. Um, he, um, after his second term, he is now practicing as a pediatric uh, pathologist in, uh, at the University of Calgary. Um, Dr. Wright uh, is very well published. He received several awards in, uh, uh, in the history of medicine and, and his research. He's very well known. But if you visit um, PubMed, you will see his publications on the following topics. He published on experimental eyelid transplantation, xenotransplantation, bioartificial pancreas technologies, comparative endocrinology, and fish biology, perinatal pathology, and med medicine uh, medical history, mostly in the area of history of insulin and laboratory medicine. So uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your talk, and we are so excited to have you.
Thanks, Mahmoud. I'll try to live up to that uh, uh, introduction. So my talk today, uh, I'm going to do this uh, because there's so much material to cover to understand how Calgary Lab Services uh, came together. Uh, I'm going to uh, practically read a lot of my slides just so that I move quickly. The object is to try to leave 15 minutes for discussion at the end because I hope what I say will be controversial and will stimulate some discussion. <laughs> so I understand from Dr. Khalifa that University of Minnesota laboratories are, and I quote, so fragmented all over the place that one suggestion is to take an off-site building to consolidate labs, end quote. So from Mahmoud's many years in Canada, he was aware of the merger that took place in Calgary and has asked me to address whether consol consolidating labs in a central off-site location has impacted negatively on departmental academics. So uh, while Mahmoud was specifically asking about the Calgary Laboratory Services Diagnostic Services Center, which is the consolidated lab off campus, uh, I first need to address how CLS formed. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So these are our uh, learning objectives. Uh, describe the origins of CLS. Evaluate how the formation of CLS affected academic output in Calgary. And to discuss which clinical lab services can be reasonably consolidated off-site and which should not. So this is going to be essentially a case study of an academic department of pathology and laboratory medicine that uh, developed from an abrupt merger of public, private, and academic pathology laboratories in Calgary, Alberta in 1996. And there was zero planning. <laughs> so in order to situate this, you need to understand a little bit about the Canadian healthcare system, a little bit about the province of Alberta, the University of Calgary Cummings School of Medicine, and the dynamics of Alberta uh, provincial healthcare system. So the next few slides will review this. So uh, in Canada, provinces have the jurisdiction over healthcare for their citizens. The federal government is a major source of funding for the provincial system. This funding is provided under the auspices of the Canada Health Act, which stipulates five principles for the receipt of these federal funds. These are the principles, public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, portability, and accessibility. So although provinces must meet the requirements of the, health, of the Health Care Act to receive federal funding, provincial governments are free to design and run health care as they see fit. Therefore, the first principle, public administration, allows day-to-day -day partisan provincial politics to interject into decision-making and sometimes to even abruptly alter the long-term course of the provincial health care system, and these turns can happen on a dime. So uh, in the Canadian health care system, the payer for laboratory services, both hospital-based and community-based, is generally the provincial government. So Alberta is geographically the fourth largest province in Canada. Uh, it's located in the western part of Canada at the interface of the prairies and the Rocky Mountains. It's a wilderness destination with many national parks. Uh, it, what, living in Calgary, I have eight different national parks that I can drive to in four hours. So the population of roughly 4 million, about 81% live in urban areas, the rest are rural. There are two large cities uh, with populations exceeding a million. Uh, Edmonton, which is the capital, and Calgary, uh, which is the most populous city. Uh, they're approximately 180, degrees apart, or 180 miles apart, and the pr province's third largest city is halfway in between those, right on the highway. So, uh, so here you can see, basically, this is the city of Calgary. Uh, colored in red here is the uh, province of Alberta. 
Uh, Calvary's located about here, Edmonton here, Red Deer halfway in between. So Alberta has an energy-based economy, and the province's fortunes are cyclical based upon community prices, uh, commodity prices. So uh, it's a traditionally a highly conservative uh, population, and in fact, for 44 years, the same provincial party was in charge, elected again and again and again. Uh, but in May of 2015, the New Democratic Party, which is basically the Socialist Party in Canada, uh, was elected. And this created some additional, more recent upheaval. So during a boom period, the province took energy revenue surpluses and created the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research in 1980. And uh, it was established to support health research within the province. So Alberta has two medical schools, uh, University of Alberta in Edmonton and University of Calgary in Calgary. And the research enterprises of both medical schools grew rapidly on soft funded salaries. So in 2010, the provincial government abruptly decided to get rid of uh, the Heritage Foundation, discontinue salary award competitions, and phase out the current salary awards, creating a, a budget crisis in both medical schools. So uh, briefly about the Faculty of Medicine in Calgary. It opened in 1970. It was designed to produce family doctors and was expected to be less academic than the longer standing medical school at the University of Alberta. The medical school campus was built adjacent to what was then the new Foothills Hospital, which opened in 1966 on the outskirts of this city, and this became the primary teaching hospital. So as you might predict, uh, when creating a new medical school from scratch in a city that has no real academic culture, the new Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine lacked an academic orientation and the local pathologists did not buy into the new expectation of an academic culture. And so uh, in the years of the medical, early years of the medical school, the pathology services were repeatedly identified in medical school accreditation reports as problematic. For instance, the uh, 1985 accreditation report for the medical school identified pathology as one of the five major weaknesses in the medical school. And I'm quoting from that report. Although improvement has occurred since 1980, the centrality of pathology in any medical school is such that this department's progress towards academic strength can only be described as disappointing. The lack of significant progress as compared to other disciplines may be due to a combination of factors such as inadequate university support, uh, previous faculty recruitment, practices, or departmental attitudes. This department should do better than heretofore, and the survey team suggests that reconsideration be given to a university hospital reevaluation of its academic future. So they were kind of suggesting starting all over. Uh, so having been identified as one of the five major weaknesses and a problem that had to be resolved before the next accreditation, Considerable effort and some money was uh, thrown at the uh, uh, department and the incoming department head, Halgamir Benedictson, who actually did some of his training here, uh, took on this problem. And uh, by the next accreditation report, uh, things were pretty complimentary. There had been seven new pathologists recruited. Three had won support as heritage scholars. Uh, with the result that the academic strength of the department had improved dramatically and that during the current survey, and I quote, did not detect con continuing problems. So, however, this nascent achievement of academic culture in pathology at Foothills Hospital in the early 1990s was to be very short-lived because it immediately predated the austerity programs associated with healthcare reorganization and the formation of Calgary Lab Services. So what was the long-term effect of the Heritage Foundation? So although the U of C Medical School uh, was not begun with the intent to be research intensive, 
it quickly evolved in that direction in large part because of the availability of salary support. However, it should be noted that other than these three first scholars that were recruited in the late 1980s, the faculty's uh, HFMR salary awards uh, for the next two decades went to other University of Calgary departments, not pathology, and it was only in the last two competitions before it was phased out in 2009 and 2010 where two uh, new research faculty were recruited. So in retrospect, this uh, Heritage Foundation salary awards primarily made the strong academic departments at the university stronger, and these departments generally have large numbers of geographic full-time faculty members. So these are faculty members that are partially funded by the University of Calgary and usually have 50 to 75 percent protected academic time. While the weaker departments, like pathology and laboratory medicine, were comprised primarily of clinical faculty members funded by the healthcare system and lacking protected time. So ironically, when they phased this out in 2010, essentially what happened was there were 60, uh, greater than 60 faculty members in other departments that now needed to have uh, their salaries subsidized. And so the, uh, any time a GFT faculty member retired in any department, that money was taken from the department. They weren't allowed to recruit to fill the position, and the money was then used to support people in other departments that were coming off these salary awards. And uh, our department got the hardest hit of all of those because we had a bunch of people ready to retire. So, uh, so currently, amongst Canadian medical schools, University of Calgary is roughly now between the 65th and 70th percentile in research output and is actually still improving. In 2014, the Faculty of Medicine was renamed Cumming School of Medicine after a local businessman, Jeffrey Cumming, donated $100 million to support neuroscience and inflammation research, and the province of Alberta matched this dollar for dollar, so a $200 million endowment. So now I'm going to move on to healthcare institutional restructuring in Alberta, because this is where things get really complicated. So in 1993, the new premier, uh, this would be the equivalent of a state governor, uh, was elected in the province of Alberta on a platform of balancing the budget and paying off all debt, $23 billion. Since healthcare was the province's largest expense, it was targeted along with other portfolios, and in 1994, the provincial healthcare budget was cut by 18% to be spread over four years. And the Alberta Medical Association, which was the union for the doctors, decided to look out for family doctors and other people and not pathologists. So uh, basically there was a 6% cut in physician billing, which included a 47% reduction in laboratory physician fees compared to a 4% reduction for all other physicians. So basically our union sold us down the road because there were only 100 of us. So... Uh, the process of healthcare uh, institutional regionalization was modeled after a system that had been developed in New Zealand. So almost immediately, 250 hospitals and public health boards from around the province were disbanded and 17 regional health authorities were created. One of these was the Cal Calgary Regional Health Authority. And these uh, changes were implemented to decrease the cost of administration. And a few years later, they decreased the number of health authorities from 17 to 9 in an attempt to cut uh, additional administrative costs. So these extreme austerity measures, although unpopular with the healthcare system, resonated sufficiently with the very conservative taxpayers that this premier was re-elected three more times. Healthcare cuts, cuts in other portfolios, and mostly increases in revenue from a boom in the oil and gas industry resulted in surpluses and eventually the goal of zero provincial debt 
was reached in 2005. Unfortunately, uh, commodity prices crashed, and uh, this was a very short-lived uh, situation, and soon uh, they were back into deficit and debt again. Alberta, which prides itself on having the lowest taxes in Canada, chose not to raise taxes. So in 2008, a new premier merged the remaining nine health authorities into a single province-wide entity with 100,000 employees called Alberta Health Services. AHS immediately became the largest health authority in Canada, the largest single employer in Alberta, and the fifth largest uh, employer in all of Canada. AHS was decided, uh, uh, divided into five zones, one of which was the AHS Calgary zone. The geographic put footprint of the Calgary Regional Health Authority and the AHS Calgary zone were exactly the same and so this latter change, while it was highly disruptive to the clinical service side, is not an important variable in the analysis of the academic model that we'll be analyzing. So as part of original regionalization process in 1994, the city of Calgary's seven hospital boards and executives were disbanded, and one board with a single executive leadership group for the region was created. As a cost containment measure, three of the seven uh, city hospitals, which were the older ones, were closed. Initially, laboratory services in Calgary were provided by seven hospital laboratories providing in-house services and uh, three or four, depending on how you count, private commercial laboratories focused primarily on community testing. These private laboratories provided 110 collection sites uh, for uh, outpatients. In 1994, the laboratory services came squarely into the province-wide budget cutting crosshairs. Over the next year, all hospital and community laboratory test funding within the province was put into a single budget. Fee codes for fee-for-service uh, test billing were closed. Roughly 40% of the provincial lab budget was cut, and 40% of the province's pathologists left in a single year. In Calgary, the four private commercial laboratory entities merged, creating two private laboratories, which fiercely competed for their survival. The provincial government indicated this was the new reality and asked laboratory physicians to suggest possible solutions. So this is the initial state. You can see kind of three commercial labs and uh, seven hospitals with labs. Uh, the altered state immediately was the kind of collapse of these uh, commercial labs. And uh, this is a famous picture that uh, whenever people in Alberta and Calgary complain about the healthcare system, they always bemoan the blowing up of the Calgary General Hospital because the remaining number of hospital beds was actually not sufficient to uh, provide for a city of a million people. So this is what the private lab business in Calgary looked like before the merger. There were three major companies, Calgary Medical Laboratories, which had a 55% market share of the community testing, it was located on 10th Avenue in downtown uh, Calgary. It was owned by MDS Labs of Ontario, and it became eventually the main CLS high volume lab after the merger. The second uh, largest uh, commercial lab, Associated Clinical Laboratories, had a 30% market share of community testing, and it was located in Northwest Calgary, and it was the major player in cytopathology. Uh, Calgary Diagnostic Labs, the smallest of the three, had a 15% market share of community testing. It was located in northeast Calgary. And then bear in mind that at this time there were seven hospital labs as well. So this is the business consolidation model. Calgary Diagnostic Lab, Associated Clinical Lab, merged to become Casper Medical Lab, uh, Calgary Medical Lab, and uh, Casper Medical Lab merged to form MDS Casper Medical Lab. The four remaining hospitals, their labs, merged to become Calgary Region Health Authority, 
and both of those merged to become Calgary Lab Services. And this all happened in the same year. So this is the business consolidation model. The government is not actually allowed to uh, run a corporation. So the Calgary Regional Health Authority formed a numbered Alberta corporation called 703590, and uh, it and MDS Casper basically merged to become Calgary Lab Services, and then Calgary Lab Services had a contract to provide lab services back to its owner, Calgary Regional Health Authority. A very bizarre scenario. So this was the desired end state as articulated at the time of the merger. There would be one high volume laboratory, there would be four rapid response labs in the hospitals, uh, there would be extensive utilization of uh, point of care technology, there would be a university laboratory affiliation agreement to support research and teaching, there'd be a single lab information system for the entire city, the tw uh, there would be 25 collection sites and there would be a mobile collection service that would go to people's homes and the expectation was that quality would remain the same or be improved. The newly formed CLS uh, inherited the facilities of the various private laboratories that had merged, but these were scattered all over the city, so not very useful. CLS also inherited the various hospital laboratories and the medical uh, school uh, department. So the intermediate steps between 1996 and 2004, 2004 is when the DSC lab formed. Uh, so CLS divested itself of the Northeast and Northwest lab buildings. Uh, Calgary Medical Labs on 10th Avenue downtown didn't have enough space. And so they rented four other nearby sites on 10th Avenue, three of these for more lab space and one for their finance office. Microbiology, uh, high volume chemistry, high volume hematology were immediately consolidated uh, to downtown. Uh, cytopathology from the associated clinical labs and the three hospital labs that also did cytopathology uh, were consolidated shortly after and dermatopathology was centralized. The thought being that you know, they don't interact with hospital clinicians, hospital real estate is more expensive than you know, a kind of a warehouse space so to speak and so the idea was that you could move all of them together and uh, you know, uh, better utilize the more valuable hospital real estate. So the overarching principles for the merger were that they were to maintain and enhance quality, turnaround time, and not geography or politics were to determine where testing was done. So everything was being uh, shoveled around, and it was determined primarily based on turnaround time needs. Routine clinical pathology testing, regardless of site, would go to a single platform and they wanted a single reference range for both hospital patients and community patients so that no matter where you got your testing done, uh, the reference range was the same for the clinicians. So uh, the next uh, part of this, I'm going to focus on how this affected the academic mandate in the Associated Medical School in Calgary. And weirdly, although it was provincial regionalization, Nothing similar to this happened in Edmonton. It kind of went on just exactly as it was before. And the reason was that two of the hospitals in Edmonton were Catholic hospitals. And the government was afraid to step into uh, this scenario. I mean, uh, Alberta still has publicly funded Catholic schools and publicly funded other schools. So uh, there was a concern that if you know uh, they shut down and merged these two Catholic hospitals into the secular system, the government might fall. And therefore, you know, uh, they didn't touch them. So Edmonton basically did not do the radical experiment that we did in Calgary, but it's happening now. Uh, so uh, the formation of Calgary Lab Services. So, and this is a quote, Calgary Lab Services began as an unhappy shotgun marriage of private commercial labs 
the pathology department of community hospitals, the Foothills Hospital, which is the university hospital, the children's hospital, and the medical school. And at the time, all the basic scientists in the pathology department at the medical school were kicked out of pathology and lab medicine. It became a totally clinical department, and they were moved to other basic science departments. And all done at the same time. Uh, so CLS was overseen by a management committee with membership from the major stakeholders. It began as a public-private partnership with private laboratory MDS Casper owning 50.1%. And uh, ironically, the minor partner, partner, Calgary Health Region, owned 49.9%, but it was the primary customer. Uh, ten years later, the Calgary Health Region bought out the private holdings, and CLS became a wholly owned subsidiary of Calgary Regional Health Authority. And I can tell you it worked much better when uh, it was a public-private partnership, and the private partner owned 50.1%. So it's worthy of noting that the restructuring was not was driven by healthcare system, and academics was not even considered when this happened. You know, it was just not even a topic on the table. Uh, furthermore, there was no specific transition funding for a common IT system or transition to a standardized testing platform. They just expected this was going to happen for free. So in this stressful environment where there had historically been a weak academic culture, community hospital pathologists, without much consultation, were now expected to uh, participate in a more academic form of practice. Predictably, this escalated the existing town and gown based antagonism between the academic and community pathologists that actually still persists today amongst the few remaining pathologists who transferred to CLS at the time its, of its formation. So the expectation was that CLS would save money for the healthcare system through economies of scale and by eliminating duplicated services and excessive capacity. So the 110 community collection centers quickly became 25 and then later 18. Uh, while still providing excellent citywide clinical uh, service by increasing standardization. So the thought was that this would cover all these costs. Uh, importantly, a single patient-centric uh, longitudinal record of laboratory results was expected to offer further savings as there would be less uh, tendency for uh, physicians to duplicate testing, uh, you know, ordering uh, duplicate tests as patients move around the healthcare system. So in 2004, all of the uh, 10th Avenue CLS labs closed and there was a movement, uh, there was additional restructuring and a movement to the new Diagnostic uh, Sciences Center laboratory which was opened on the U of C research campus. So uh, within the circle uh, you can see the, uh, this is the DSC building. This is the main campus for University of Calgary. And way in the distance, you can see kind of Foothills Hospital. So this was the new Calgary Lab Services. Here you can see the entrance. Uh, so a very nice work environment. And that building actually... Uh, we were able to get it because it was initially put up by the petroleum industry to do research on oil sands and how to extract petroleum from the oil sands. And that technology developed so quickly, they didn't need the building anymore. And so it was up for rent. So each remaining hospital site in Calgary retained all of its anatomic pathologists. It retained frozen sections. Uh, and there was ease of physician consultation because they didn't move, and it also promoted teaching. Uh, each hospital had a rapid response laboratory. Uh, there was outpatient collection, uh, accession, uh, biochemistry, hematology, urinalysis, and transfusion medicine, uh, point-of-care testing, and QA. 
All microbiology for the city and surrounding Calgary Health Region, 1.6 million population, was moved to the DSC. Some other services were centralized to a single site, not necessarily the DSC, but as the various pieces were moving around, it created space in hospitals, and that allowed uh, things to centralize. So this is the current service delivery model, and uh, anything that's in red uh, is a consolidated service. So you can see at the DSC, uh, microbiology, immunochemistry, analytical toxicology, molecular hematology, special coagulation, tissue typing, cytopathology, cytogenetics, dermatopathology, and kind of the lab information system, and uh, the central quality uh, uh, office were all located there. Foothills Hospital over here, the, uh, the university hospital, had special hematology, flow cytometry, uh, hematopoietic cell processing lab, uh, adult autopsy. So all adult autopsies were now done at the morgue at the Foothills Hospital. So a patient dying in any other hospital or dying at home was transported there. Uh, neuropathology was based there, uh, AP molecular pathology, and uh, uh, it says research, but not really. Uh, research was kind of uh, still everywhere, but they liked to, to claim it, and some battles aren't worth you know, fighting for an org chart. So uh, Alberta Children's Hospital uh, ended up with centralized pediatric perinatal autopsy service. So all placentas from all hospitals in the whole system, 20,000 deliveries a year, uh, any that were met the criteria for uh, being uh, examined were all sent to the children's hospital. Any perinatal uh, deaths, uh, fetal deaths uh, in any of the hospitals all came to the children's hospital for uh, evaluation by pediatric perinatal pathologists. And... You can also see a new hospital here. Remember when they blew up the Calgary General and there weren't enough beds? So they built another hospital. And uh, for very political reasons, it was located a long way from the medical school in uh, the writing of a particularly very strong politician. So it ended up being essentially an hour drive between the medical school and you know, this new hospital. So there were two real big events in the... Sorry, yeah. Jim, the histology was... Uh, His, you, so yeah. histology, uh, histology has moved in several different times. When I started, there was a histology lab at the Children's Hospital. There was a histology lab at the Foothills Hospital. Uh, there was a uh, histology lab at South Health Campus when they built it. Uh, there was a histology lab uh, at the Peter Lougheed Center, and there was a histology lab at the DSC. Uh, these uh, kind of folded and merged. So the DSC lab, which was geographically close to Peter Lougheed Center and the Children's Hospital, became the histology lab for both. Uh, the Foothills Hospital maintained its histology lab actually come to think of it, and then the Rocky View Hospital and the South Health Campus ended up sharing a histology lab. So uh, basically uh, samples were being grossed at the hospital that they were generated, but the cassettes were sent to one of these locations to be processed, and uh, then they would come back to the hospital to be signed out by the anatomic pathologists at the hospital. Yeah, thank you for asking that, because that probably was not clear. So uh, in 2006, the Calgary Regional Health Authority was bought out, the, or, or bought out the private partner. So we became a wholly owned subsidy of Calgary Health Region, which uh, meant that our owner was our customer. And although that would seem like a good idea as far as that the customer, uh, you know, uh, you know, should have some say in how the services are provided. The customer now had all say in how services pr were provided. And, you know, lab services are supposed to be good, fast, and cheap. They were mostly interested in cheap. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, that was kind of bad news. We didn't know it at the time. 
In May 2008, Calgary Health Region Authority was merged along with the other eight autonomous health regions into Alberta Health Services. So CLS became a wholly owned subsidiary of Alberta Health Services. So at this point, we now have a province-wide entity that's trying to micromanage decisions related to the lab services we provide. So we lost a fair bit of autonomy in that uh, merger. So the current state for CLS, it's one of the largest multi-site integrated acute and community laboratory practices in North America. We have uh, 82 MDs, 13 clinical PhDs, 28 of which the, of these faculty members are U of C appointments, so GFTs, and uh, 67 are clinical appointments, so employees of CLS, or they formed private uh, corporations and work for CLS. So uh, the, it provides uh, regional laboratory services with a single centralized laboratory uh, called the Diagnostic Scientific Center, specialty testing laboratories, five rapid, rapid response laboratories, one in each hospital, uh, 19 community collection centers, a mobile collection center, a single centralized transport system that is actually run internally by CLS. And it actually works pretty well because we control it. And then a single zone-wide information system. So these are the test volumes for 2016. Greater than 30 million total uh, lab tests, uh, 157,000 uh, adult surgical pathology cases, 194 adult autopsy cases. None of these would be uh, medical examiner cases. These are hospital cases. Uh, about uh, 203,000 gynae cytopathology cases, 12,000 uh, non-gynae cytopathology cases, uh, 6,300 uh, pediatric surgical pathology cases, that includes placentas, and uh, 231 pediatric perinatal autopsy cases. So did this grand experiment save money? And I am going to get to academics in just a minute. So uh, yes, it actually did. Uh, the annual operating expenses decreased in 1996 from 110 million to 60 million at the time of the transition. But what they hadn't planned on there were there were tens of millions of one-time transition costs, which they had to come up with the money. Uh, so switching to a common testing platform, implementing a system-wide LIS. So this uh, slide basically shows uh, the lab services cost since we're a monop since we're dealing with a healthcare monopoly and we're a lab monopoly. You can actually just look at CLS as a percentage of healthcare costs for the whole zone. And you can see that it uh, uh, dropped, uh, this would be the year after the transition, so it had already dropped considerably, but uh, basically from 7.9% to 5.7% of healthcare costs. So, how was academics affected? Like I said, academics wasn't even thought about when this was happening. It was just, you know, you're along for the ride. So related to teaching, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have good data prior to uh, really like the year 2000 on anything. Nobody was keeping records. It just, you know, it was a mess. Uh, but uh, in 2004, uh, we had two uh, residency training programs, anatomic pathology and uh, neuropathology. In Canada, neuropathology is a specialty, not a subspecialty, and so it's a five-year residency program. Uh, we had fellowship programs that we offered at CLS. We don't know kind of which ones exactly. It was just kind of haphazard. Uh, whoever, you know... Uh, found somebody they wanted as a fellow, there were two funded slots, and then they would fight over it. And uh, so by 2016, um, we had AP, and the AP residency program uh, basically uh, had a couple of foreign medical graduates and it was almost empty. Uh, the neuropathology residency training program 
uh, had one or two people in it, you know, over a five-year span. And uh, so by 2016, the AP residency program was vibrant. It uh, was filling in the match uh, pretty much every year with the people that they wanted to recruit. The neuropathology residency was successfully taking people whenever there was a good applicant. Uh, you know, they wouldn't, if, you know, if the applicant was so-so, you know, they would just pass that year. Uh, we formed a new general pathology residency training program. General pathology is the Canadian term for APCP. And uh, so there had not been, a, you know, a training program for general pathologists, even though most of the general pathologists in Canada were quite old, working at hospitals across Canada, and none of them, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, had, uh, um, you know, any place to replicate themselves to create more general pathologists. The uh, so the medical, uh, we created a new medical microbiology training program. We formalized our uh, fellowship program. We had 13 different programs that competed for eight CLS-funded slots. Uh, we started a pathology assistant master's degree, which was initially thesis-based, but eventually became course-based uh, so that we could train more people. So this slide just shows the increase in the number of residents in the various programs. The one little time period where there's a postgraduate year seven was somebody who decided to do both AP and neuropath back to back. So that created longer than the normal PGY5. So as I indicated, there were uh, these new residency programs. The general pathology residency program was so innovative that, innovative that the uh, Royal College, which evaluates training programs, thought this would revitalize you know, GP training across all Canada. Uh, it was based on kind of you know, uh, an academic model with uh, um, you know, lab informatics. Everybody was learning lab informatics. Everybody was learning about utilization theory, all that kind of stuff. And so it was quite innovative. Uh, here you can see the residents in each program. Uh, so, as I indicated before, we have eight CLS-funded positions per year. Uh, four have to go to AP specialties. Two can go to either AP or CP, and two go to chemistry because it's a two-year program. Uh, so, uh, basically, these are the uh, programs that we have and the program directors. And uh, the pathology assistant <laughs> program is the second in Canada. Uh, the program director is one of our graduates, uh, and uh, I remain as the medical director. The, uh, it started as a thesis-based program. We had 30 to 40 applicants per year for one to three entry positions. When the course-based uh, program began, it took uh, almost three years of negotiation with government to allow us to do it, even though the government was not funding a penny of it. Uh, so we're approved to train up to 10 MSc entry students per year, and we have about 50 applicants per year. And some are American because we're uh, certified in the U.S., so uh, people can come and train in very cheap Canadian dollars and then go back to the U.S. So we also provide placements for uh, um, technical training at three different uh, technical training schools, so medical laboratory assistants, medical laboratory technologists, cytotech students. And we also run uh, our Banff pathology course, which is uh, likely the premier annual Canadian uh, pathology CME event. It's co-sponsored by the Canadian Association of Pathologists, University of Alberta and University of Calgary sponsor it in altering years. We get 120 to 180 registrants across Canada, and uh, uh, some in the U.S., some abroad. It's accredited for CME both in the U.S. and Canada. And uh, so we, uh, uh, so moving on to research. So our department, because of the way CLS works, we're a 100% clinical department. There's not a single person that has. Uh, a research job. Everybody earns their money by being a clinician. Uh, so there are no pure basic scientists. Uh, 
we have no ability to control lab space because that's controlled centrally by the medical school through an institute model where the institutes uh, deliver space to people as they're recruited. And, you know, whereas the cardiovascular institute has a nice alignment with cardiology, uh, pathology doesn't match any of the institutes. And we also don't have a PhD program in pathology. But in order to get good metrics, uh, I had to kind of go back and blow everything up because you know, there's a tendency when people provide their own research data, you know, they want to hide abstracts in their list of publications. You know, uh, the same paper sometimes is reported year after year as submitted in press, EPUB ahead print, and then the next time you know, with the actual publication data, so we started confirming with PubMed and other resources everything everybody submitted. We insisted on standardized descriptive information uh, related to grant funding, and we didn't include data for cross appointments. And so this, I had to go back before I even started as department head and reevaluate everything before that to get some longitudinal information. So this red line basically shows the number of GFT faculty members, the ones that are supported by the medical school. You can see that in recent years it's gone down a bit. Uh, but the publication uh, thing, so the DSC formed in 2004, and uh, you can see that there has been a good increase. That's not necessarily because of the DSC, but in part it is. So this next slide just basically shows over the last 10 years that essentially the mean impact factor of the publications coming from our department was uh, uh, roughly four. Or, you know, the impact factor for the journals that these were published in. So uh, I've highlighted here the two uh, groups that moved to the DSC. So you can see that in each of the divisions, you know, for AP Cyto, uh, which did not move, uh, there was... Uh, an increase in productivity. Uh, clinical pathology, which sometimes has been called general pathology and clinical biochemistry, and sometimes been called clinical pathology. For this metric, I just merged them together permanently. But you can see a rapid and uh, you know, strong increase with the DSC. Microbiology was academically strong at the very beginning, and they had some staffing issues which were rectified, and then productivity started going back up again. So it's been good for uh, micro and CP. Hematology transfusion medicine is part at the DSC and part at Foothills Hospital. Uh, it's done well as well. So grant funding in our department is pathetic uh, by, uh, you know, we don't have lab space, we don't have basic scientists, uh, you can see what happened here, but we do not attract federal funds very readily. Book chapters aren't, and books aren't really a measure of research. They're a measure of kind of academic stature. You know, you're not generally asked to write chapters and that kind of stuff unless you're well known. So this is not a research measure, but it shows that our academic profile has increased. So this breaks down the number of publications in the anatomic pathology division by site. And uh, you can see at Foothills, uh, you know, it went up. Uh, at Children's, it went up. Rocky View Hospital, which is a regional center for uh, uh, GU surgery, so all GU surgery in the whole region is done there, developed quite a strong GU pathology group. And so it went up. Uh, the South Health campus was not built uh, with the expectation of uh, you know, any kind of productivity, and that's uh, proved to do that. Uh, PLC pretty much has no expectation. The DSC, which would be entirely uh, the dermatopathology group, is quite variable. There isn't a strong pattern. You know, this just basically shows that uh, GFT faculty members produce more papers per year than the clinical faculty, but both, because it's an academic environment now, have been gradually kind of working their way up. So this was a, a treat where the uh, 
research office at the medical school decided to do a research report card for every department. This was in my last year as department head. And uh, so they told us that this is our profile of 28% of our uh, you know, 28 GFT uh, pathologists basically are the equivalent of 7.15 full-time researchers. And so the metrics are based on that. So that number of full-time researchers places us 11th out of 20 uh, departments in the medical school. And uh, so this is based on research equivalents. Roughly for every research equivalent, we have two uh, graduate students that are supervised in the department. Uh, this slide shows that pathology, uh, highlighted here in green, basically is right in the middle of the pack as far as the number of publications per FTE. So that's for the 20, divided by 28. When you divide it by seven, uh, we actually uh, basically produce 14.55 publications per uh, research equivalent, and the mean in the medical school is 3.19. So we're actually hitting way above uh, average. The average number of citations per FTE, you can see here highlighted in green, uh, we're about number eight. But if you switch that to research equivalents, uh, the lower uh, um, illustration here, you can see that we have about 702 uh, citations per research equivalent compared to 287 for the average for the faculty of medicine. And then as far as high impact publications, you can see that these are ones that were uh, cited more than 50 times, uh, you know, 50 or more times in the first five years. Uh, basically an upward trend where we are now tied for second in the faculty of medicine for this last year that they provided data. And uh, so you can see uh, this, uh, the other graphic uh, is on a different scale on the right-hand side, but you can see the overall pattern is upward for the Department of Pathology as far as high-impact publications. This slide I particularly like because it shows the cost per publication. Because we're so poor at getting grant money and we're so good at publishing papers, we uh, plot out along with psychiatry at like the cheapest per publication. So. <laughs> And then this shows just productivity amongst the 28 GFTs, how many papers they had published. So improvements cannot be directly attributed to lab consolidation. There was extensive growth in hiring of clinical faculty, but most of the growth was related to the output of the GFT faculty. Microbiology, chemistry, and general pathology divisions definitely benefited. Hematology, transfusion medicine likely benefited. Uh, anatomic pathology was not harmed, and it likely depended, benefited because lab space or uh, offices cleared out in the hospitals, which allowed us to hire more uh, anatomic pathologists and put them in the hospital. So uh, from uh, 2005 to 2015, when I stepped down as department head, uh, we did a total of 77 recruitments. There were 36 departures, so a net gain of 41 people. And you can see that over 85% of the recruitments during this time period were clinical faculty, not GFT, and the percentage of GFTs decreased. So just the last little measure of academics uh, overall, we're unequivocally a much more academically mature department than at the time of the formation of DSC. Before 2005, there had never been a faculty member in the history of the department with greater than 100 publications. Uh, we have now nine uh, faculty members with over 100 publications, three with greater than 150, and one with uh, greater than 250. We all of a sudden started winning awards for teaching and all types of other things. In fact, uh, we even had in 2015, uh, the students picked the single best professor in uh, the medical school, uh, and it was one of ours. And so, you know, this model has actually worked well for academics. The, uh, in 2015, 
we had our first three ever endowed or named chairs. Uh, and, uh, you know, GFT faculty members always want to be promoted, whereas our clinical faculty, in the whole history of the medical school, there had never been a clinical faculty person who even applied to become promoted. They didn't care because it didn't affect their income. Uh, in that time period, 16 clinical faculty members were promoted, and uh, half of these were based at the DSC. So because of this uh, kind of research environment that had developed and uh, the academic environment, clinical faculty now wanted to be recognized for their teaching, et cetera, and so they started applying for promotion. And this slide just shows basically that in 2005, uh, of the clinical faculty, 11% were at the Associate of Full Professor rank, and in 2015, 31%. And uh, you can see the huge hiring of assistant professors. The three lecturers are uh, master's trained uh, pathology assistants who do teaching for us. And so the five keys to academic success at CLS, one was the remuneration system, where service, teaching, and research were remunerated at the same rate. The second was a robust university CLS affiliation agreement. Uh, another issue was gaining buy-in for the academic mandate for managing this difference between clinical faculty who view themselves as second class and the GFTs. Turnover helped a lot because people that didn't like what was happening left. And then that allowed me to recruit people that did buy into what was happening. And uh, so the most important observation I made while department head is that academics will flourish if you hire the right faculty members. They just have to have uh, And so uh, basically, I think this is the last slide. So what can you consolidate and not consolidate? Anatomic pathology absolutely has to remain near clinicians. You can't uh, you know, uh, manage either clinical operations or academics if they're not based in the hospitals. Rapid response labs can handle urgent CP testing. Clinical pathology and microbiology can be strengthened by consolidation, which achieves critical mass. In our environment, this created a powerhouse for lab informatics and utilization <coughs> research. Molecular labs we never succeeded in getting them merged, but likely that would have been a good thing. And you have to have good video conferencing, reciprocal parking, all that kind of stuff to allow people to uh, uh, kind of interact. And planning actually really would have helped. You know. <laughs> so anyway, I, I'm done. <laughs> Okay. Forty years ago, Canada made a decision that it was appropriate for the country to provide universal health care. The United States has been having this discussion for 70 years. Yeah. We're still having this discussion, and we have not provided universal health care in this country. What do you think those two different decisions, how do you think they influenced what you did in, in, uh, in uh, Calgary? Well, Calgary could not have happened without universal health care system. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, so there's just absolutely no way it could have. Um, the ideal health care system is Canada minus one of those five uh, criteria that I listed at the very beginning, mm -hmm. you know, that allows the government to make decisions. <laughs> if the government <laughs> was just providing the money and that they allowed boards to be arm's length and not micromanaged by what happened the, next, the day before in the newspaper, the system would work perfectly. Okay. Uh, that is the fundamental problem, is the government. Uh, so government health care system works, but the government shouldn't be allowed to run it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mahmoud. Uh, Jim, for, uh, for full disclosure, I never asked Jim to uh, put the first bullet on the screen. 
This is completely uh, his work. I, I detach myself from that. Uh, uh, Jim, you, you, uh, your GFT numbers decreased. Your, uh, yeah. your uh, lab was not getting... Uh, the, 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 the research intense faculty were removed. Your lab was not funded. Your department was not funded for research. And despite all of that, your publications uh, increased, and your, the, the, the engagement of pathologists, mm -hmm. of your faculty with research, increased. And last night at dinner, you hinted towards recruiting the right uh, people with the right attitude, yeah. and that was buried in a, in a bullet on the slide before that. If you can uh, elaborate a little bit about the, uh, the uh, attitude of faculty who are uh, in an academic department to get promoted, to get engaged and to learn. Okay, so uh, yeah, very good and complicated question. So uh, early as department head, I had, had to actually help some people see the door. And uh, you know, because they just didn't buy into the system at all and they were disruptive. And uh, so uh, as the opportunity arose to replace these people, um, the recruitment process became exceedingly important. And uh, you know, in addition to just looking at you know, what their training was you know, or you know, what their background was, you had to see evidence that they liked to teach. And so you look for people that get teaching awards as residents and uh, you know, that uh, you know, publish as residents. Uh, you know, so we wanted to bring in people that bought into the whole academic mandate, that they were coming to a medical school, even though they were likely coming to a position that would have no protected time and that was entirely clinical, you know, as long as they value uh, you know, these things and think it's important, they're going to do it. And uh, you know, they make, people make time for what they enjoy doing. And so you pick people <coughs> that you know when you're interviewing them you can tell they just ooze enthusiasm for uh you know teaching you know they in ooze enthusiasm for writing clinical papers uh we also focused you know so you also look at what you're potentially good at in a system where you have no you know basic science lab space hiring basic scientists not a good idea. I proved that was wrong because I was brought in as a basic scientist and they didn't provide me with the things I had been promised when I was recruited, which made me less of a basic scientist, but then I realized kind of what a big system I was in and that it you know, really was a full-time job just being department head. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, so you don't, uh, you know, the, the few times you can recruit a GFT faculty member, you have to make sure that it's signed in blood. You know, their startup funds, you know, their lab space, what equipment they're going to have, what research group they're going to be in, you know, and then the people that you bring in that are clinical faculty, try to bring in people that have interests in things that can flourish in our system. So uh, hiring good GU pathologists in a system where there is a monopoly for 1.6 million people of all GU specimens, that's going to flourish if you bring in the right people. And you know, in a system where you provide uh, 30 million lab tests and you have a single lab information system, bring in people that are interested in informatics. Bring in people that are interested in studying lab utilization. These people will flourish in that environment because they've got a monopoly on data. Thank you. Yes? Just like, I think in the clinic is the most time consuming, but you still even don't need that much money, but you still need money. How do you prove a clinical research project and how do you follow up in public? So, uh, so we have a small subset of people, our GFTs, Probably a third of them are highly research intensive. Uh, two thirds I kind of inherited, and uh, they will eventually retire. And my successor, I hope, will hire, you know, research intensive people if they're. So those individuals are well funded. Uh, we have three endowed chairs now, uh, which we had never had before. Uh, 
the clinical type research, you don't actually really need money to do it. You, uh, you have to basically facilitate them doing it, like getting access to lab information and everything. You don't want to like be charging them money to try to get information that would help them write a good clinical paper. So, uh, so that's basically you know, uh, how it works financially. And we do have a small amount of research funds set aside within CLS where people can apply for internal grants for small projects. We'll uh, have to stop here because uh, Jim is literally heading to the airport right now and there's a cab waiting for him. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And I didn't leave as much time for questions as I wanted, so... Uh, you know, you can get my email address uh, from Dr. Khalifa, and if you have a burning question, I'm, you know, I'm happy to answer it. I can give you a call.